Salutations, fellow readers, writers, and killers of time on YouTube. My name is Martha Jones, and I would like to use the androgynous sounds of my voice to rave and complain about a very old children's book for this many minutes. I, like many morally bankrupt millennials, am fascinated with blood sport. Therefore, for an entire year, I have devoured every morsel of roast generated by the critical vivisection of Cats 2019, a sad facsimile of the Broadway and cultural phenomenon of the same name, which happens to be based on a book of poems by T.S. Eliot called Old Possum's Book Practical Cats. The book is not particularly long, and I believed in my heart and soul that this was going to be a nice, gentle review. Alas, it was not that simple, in part I think because I grew up with a stage show, and in other part because T.S. Eliot is kind of a mess. And so many thoughts and feelings had I on this book that I had to break my thoughts into manageable chunks, beginning with Part 1. Ready-Made Lyrics So when you are a composer, in essence there are three ways you get lyrics for your stuff. You crib a story that is in the public domain and for which no one will sue you. You offer to share your royalties with someone who is somewhat more brilliant at lyrics than you are. Or you fill your head with filth and lies and tell yourself you are every bit as good a lyricist as Tim Rice. But T.S. Eliot's cat poems were not in the public domain, so the fact that Mr. Webber was willing to negotiate for the rights with Eliot's widow means that he probably loved those poems an awful lot. The way Webber felt about Old Possum's Book of Practical Cats was probably a lot like the way some feel about Game Boys or their Studio Ghibli collection. Old people, I guess. It's alright, I don't know if that's going to be the first or last time I date myself in this video. The thing is, when Webber went to adapt Cats, I think his mind kind of dismissed about half of the book. Because if I had to ballpark it, I'd say about 40% of Old Possum's Book of Practical Cats is ready-made lyrics. There's strategic repetition, there's whimsical word choice, and the type is offset, denoting verse, chorus, verse, chorus to people who are familiar with lyrics. And if the only poems that you remembered were that of Mr. Misopheles and Rum Tum Tugger, you would think, duh, let's make it a musical. But not all the poems are like that. Some of them are excruciatingly long and dull. Like, it's something of a miracle that Gus the Theater Cat's song is hummable and gets stuck in your head at all, so good as to Mr. Weber for that. It's actually a super long, dry poem. Also, while all of these poems are in the same book, they don't necessarily have a lot of connective tissue, except for the fact they're all more or less about cats. So there was always pretty much two choices with the musical. Either make it a musical review, where it's just song, 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 dance, 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 song, 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 dance, 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 that isn't supposed to have anything to do with each other, or add a plot somehow. And for reasons I cannot fathom, they went with the latter. Which brings us to... Part 2. The plot thickens. Such as it is. One of the first things critics of Cats point to, if not the first thing, is the whisper-thin plot. But what little they added actually does a lot of heavy lifting. In the book, there is no Jellicle choice, there is no heavy side layer, there is a Jellicle wall, there is an old Deuteronomy, but he's not the leader of the cats. He's just an old, worn-out cat that the humans kind of tiptoe around because they're scared that he'll break himself in half if he wakes from a nap with too much gusto. There is no memory, and there is no Grisabella, because apparently T.S. Eliot or his publisher decided she was too inappropriate for children. And the reason they presumably thought she was inappropriate was this. She flitted above the no man's land From the rising sun to the friend at hand Grisabella has fallen on hard times, and for reasons that are not made plain to us, she has become a sex worker. That's why she's not accepted by the Jellicle Cats. Why they don't want to touch her. Why they teach their children to be afraid of her. And for this sector of the populace, I think we could have a rousing discussion about whether no representation or bad representation is better. I don't think I'm qualified to answer that question. I do find it a little weird that Grisabella is slut-shamed by cats. Because it's okay to give it away 40 or 50 times a day, but gad only forbid you try to sell it. This is made so much worse in the show, because she doesn't necessarily want to go to the heavy side layer. All she wants is acceptance. And when the rest of the Jellicles finally, finally feel like they're on the verge of a breakthrough, they decide to send her to the heavyside layer. Like, we're so sorry we've behaved badly to you, but we're going to kill you now and hope that you come back better in the next life. Way to kill your strays, 80s era Broadway. So Elliot opts not to include Grisabella. Fine. He had reasons. They all suck. We'll get to those presently. But without Grisabella, the only cat that is explicitly female is Jenny Annie Dots, who is a respectable house cat by day and a teacher by night strictly defined gender roles in which the sexually liberated Grisabella would not be welcome. So Grisabella has not made the cut. Fine. But that makes the stuff that did make the cut... interesting. Part 3. Imperialism is good, children. So in the middle of this book of cat poems, there's this poem about dogs. Of the awful battle of the peaks and the pollicles, together with some account of the participation of the pugs and the palms and the intervention of the great rumpus cat. I did not memorize that, but I happen to know some of you are teachers and I would have demanded extra credit. Anyway, if you've seen this bit from the stage show out of context, it's the bit where the cats are going... 
and you might be inclined to go, I don't think that's what cats say. And it wouldn't be the worst offender ever for padding out your book, like not even in the top 10, but it's a little weird. It would be like reading The Hunchback of Notre Dame all the way through to the middle and finding a chapter about chiropractors. And then there's like this alarming number of racial slurs, like especially in Growl Tiger's Last Stand. In the show they handle those by making Growl Tiger a part that Gus the theater cat is playing. Like you get that extra step removed, like we know Gus is not saying these awful things, he is playing the part of Growl Tiger. But by putting Growl Tiger in the middle of Gus's song, you end up with this excruciating 18 minute song in your second act. I swear, as an eight year old watching this show for the first time, I thought I had fallen asleep and woken up at a different show. Anyway, the reason Growl Tiger looks and sounds like this. It's because in the book he's in this one man race war against the Siamese cats. The Persian and the Siamese regarded him with fear, because it was a Siamese had mauled his missing ear. It gets worse. Then Gilbert gave the signal to his fierce Mongolian horde, with a frightful burst of fireworks that shh. The, the word that rhymes with sphinx and some ignorant people occasionally use to describe Chinese people? They swarmed aboard. No, no, don't tell me. The TS stands for totally sensitive, right? So finding all of this in a book that Elliot meant for his actual godchildren stubbornly begs the question, why is Growl Tiger on Elliot's A string when Grizabella is on his proverbial G string? A good question that, to which I'm afraid the answer is, Elliot was really racist, sexist, and classist. Like disapproved of racial equality, even going so far as to call the Jews by name, committing his first wife to an insane asylum for infidelity, and going out of his way to reject Animal Farm in his editorial position, stating that what the world really needs is more public-spirited pigs. And if you're something of an apologist by nature and you want to think the best of your fellow man, maybe think that this guy was just a dude of his time and this is the way everybody thought, or if you choose to believe that death of the author is a thing, that is your right and privilege. But for my money, the learning of all this cast kind of an ominous shadow on the poems in this book. Jenny Annie Dot's no longer merely a teacher. She's a missionary to less civilized races, like mice and cockroaches. Growl Tiger is not a cautionary tale, he is a tragic hero. The dog poem in this cat book is not actually about dogs. Listen to this. Now when these bold heroes together assembled, the traffic all stopped and the underground trembled. And some of the neighbors were so much afraid, they started to ring up the fire brigade. When suddenly, up from a small basement flat, why, who should stalk out but the great rumpus scat? Yada yada, dedo dedo, etc, etc. And when the police dog returned to his beat, there wasn't a single one left on the street. The cats are the superior race. While you non-cats need to sort you out as a strong-willed cat, and you'll be right as rain. Mit thunder und blitzen. And I get it, I am probably reading too much into this stupid kid's book and the play thereafter, but, like, look at Jenny Annie Dots here and tell me that her mice, to whom she is teaching music crocheting and tatting, do not look like a sweatshop. My darling viewers, reassure me that that is not what that looks like, and I'll believe you. Maybe not. I don't know. The point is, that's a lot to digest in a kid's book. And I'm tempted to dismiss the entire book as rubbish and not recommend it to a single soul. Here's the thing. Part 4. But that illustrator, man. I am 100% certain that this book would not have been made into a musical if it hadn't been for the pictures. For most of its existence, this book has been mated with these wonderful whimsical pictures of cats full of personality being cats. Their faces go with the names Mungo Jerry and Rumble Teaser and the Rum Tum Tugger. The illustrations are gorgeous! and also a little unsettling. The one I kept coming back to was this. I kept staring at this picture, and staring at it, and staring at it, thinking this style looks so familiar. You know what it reminds me of? And I thought, nah. Really? Yes, really, same guy. For those of you who are well aware of this beautiful man and his illustrations, I am so sorry, I am late to the party, I'm just catching up. For those of you who are uninitiated, meet Edward Gorey, award-winning author, set designer, and illustrator of pictures so gothic they make Wednesday Adams look like Dora the Explorer. So I'm torn, because the illustrations are so good, and the text is so problematic. Yet at the bitter end of the day, if you add a positive number to a negative number, you just get a smaller negative number. And part five, final thoughts. A few years back I had a friend who grieved that one of her acquaintance said that Kanye West was the T.S. Eliot of his time. That was before I had read T.S. Eliot, and at the time I probably would have assumed that that lady was on pretty solid ground. Since the beginning of research for this video, I've thought of that incident more than once and thought, hold it. One of these guys is a wealthy, self-important poet who overvalues his work and doesn't know when to shut up. 
The other, of course, is Kanye West. As always, thank you for giving these videos a shot. I post whenever the day job allows. Meantime, take it easy. Loves you. Bye. Hey folks, I am coming to you from my 70s colored kitchen and doing something a little different with the end of the video because there are a non-zero amount of people who took me seriously when I said like my channel, buy my crap, and they felt terrible when they bought my crap. So back when I was a theater weirdo, I was with that first awful fiance and I wouldn't have stayed with him so long if it was all bad. At the time I had my first nursing gig, so I was not able to be in Cats, but I was ready if for some reason I got fired and I had to go back to the theater. So under the influence of God knows what, I decided to try to climb down the stairs as would a cat. So I stretch myself out in something like a 45 degree angle facing downward, and by the time I have my limbs sprawled out all over the stairs, I look down and I see the 10 or so feet to the bottom of the stairs at the landing and go, oh dear, if I lose my grip, I'm going to break my face as if I hadn't lost my grip years before. And so I get about halfway down the stairs going gingerly, trying not to break my face. And my poor fiance wakes up and looks at me sprawled prone on the stairs and does, of course, what every fiance does. Oh God, oh God, oh God, oh God, are you okay? No, 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 it's okay, it's okay, I'm not broken. I just wanted to figure out how cats climb down the stairs. And this look of simultaneous relief and disgust just kind of washed over his face. And he just kind of went, you know what? I forgot that I'm engaged to a nut job. Carry on. Which, in fairness, is the way all rational humans should respond to theater weirdos. There's so many things that happen to me that I absolutely deserve.